Good morning, everybody. I'm very excited to be bringing to you the first ever Microsoft 365 hours for public sector, the office hours specifically dedicated to the US national tenants, the GCC, GCC high and DOD tenants. Um, you know, there's a lot of content around the, the commercial side of the world. And I thought, talked to some of my good friends here and we thought it was time to really kick things off and, and support you, the government customer, the contracting customer, et cetera. Um, my name is Jay Leesk. I'm a principal solution engineer here at AvPoint Public Sector. Uh, and with me, I've got a panel of very smart public sector focused people uh, who I'm actually going to do round robin style and allow them to introduce themselves. Uh, Amy, you want to kick us off? Sure thing. Uh, my name is Amy Cisse, CEO and founder of Cisse IT Solutions. We work with a couple of um, government agencies and I'm looking forward to this podcast. Oh, me. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Gilbert. I am the community manager for the Microsoft public sector tech community. Uh, and we will actually be posting a the video of this into the public sector tech community, as well as engaging with our community before and after the show. So I'm really looking forward to it. Rima. Hi everybody, my name is Rima Reyes. I am a principal PM in Microsoft Teams Engineering. So uh, I work with a team that actually builds and creates teams for Gov, and my focus is federal Gov and DOD, so go Gov. Hey everybody, I'm Matt Littleton. Uh, I'm an advanced compliance specialist out of our worldwide commercial business. So focused across all of the compliance offerings inside M365. We've got a particular remit uh, to actually focus on the GCC, GCC high uh, in DOD environments. So happy to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. And I'm Jeremy Wood. I uh, work for a federal agency, so I'm the government representative of our group here today and uh, happy to share my experience as well as uh, ask questions of these awesome people who can hopefully answer them for us gov gov govies. Thanks, everybody. So uh, the four corners of this event are your regular uh, hosts for this uh, for this monthly um, video podcast thing. Uh, I'm never sure what to call it as a video cast, a vidcat, who knows? Anyway, so your four corners, myself, Sarah, Rima, and Jeremy are very excited to bring this to you on a monthly cadence. Uh, and then in the middle, Amy and Matt, we're super excited to have you help kick this off. Uh, some quick housekeeping if you have questions for us sarah mentioned the public sector tech community uh, where we will be kind of hosting ourselves um, but clearly if you want to hit us up on linkedin or twitter you've got uh, the the avpoint information on the bottom but you also have each of our uh, twitter or linkedin handles so feel free to reach out to us and and we'd be happy to try and bring yeah, Lynn, where we'd be happy to try and and bring those questions in either well maybe today but more than likely in in next month's session. So uh, to kick us off, what is the podcast? Um, 
So just briefly, what we what we're planning to do is is we're going to have a, a monthly cadence to talk about what's happening related to the government tenants of M365. Um, this month we had Ignite, so we're going to have a special segment on on Ignite, uh, and then we'll kick through any no, any news announcements that happened last month. Um, we'll we'll focus some time on the community Q and A. So we're we're scouring different communities. Uh, like the subreddit for uh, Office 365, um, Discord, and a couple of others. So if you're in a government-focused community and you want to make sure we see where questions might happen, feel free to tweet us with that information. And then we'll end with a quick announcement of upcoming community events for the next month. So uh, user groups or conferences specifically focused on ensuring the government, uh, government users know what's coming in, in the community. Um, today, as I mentioned, we're going to focus really on Ignite and then news for the month of February. So why don't we start with this? Uh, Amy, do you want to kick us off? What got you, what, what really grabbed your attention this, uh, this past week at Ignite? Of course, um, Viva. Um, that really got my attention with just um, having considerations for protecting time um, in your calendar and manager insights so that people are more um, aware of how they're scheduling. Um, I feel like people, especially in the government space, they are ridiculously busy. And sometimes when we're offering training sessions, people can't even stay the entire session because they have to go to a meeting. Um, so I think um, scheduling is definitely gonna be important with um, those new features in Viva. Yeah, and, and Rima, you have a, <laughs> Are you able to talk a little bit about what what we can look forward to with Viva and when we might be able to, if we might be able to see that on the government side? Yeah, so I actually spoke to the Viva team and they're they're really excited actually to bring this into Gov. Um, there's a few dependencies that we're still working on to make sure that they're in the GCC and, and other government environments first. Um, but they do have a plan, which was just so exciting to hear because yeah. that I like I, I was the first one who got to ask the question and they, they chuckled and they're like, yes, yes, it's we do plan on having it come to Gov. And so part of that, too, is I know there's there's some Yammer, um, you know, pieces that are part of Viva, which is really cool. And the Yammer team actually piped up and said, yeah, you know, we plan on getting FedRamp and actually coming into the government clouds, which is also huge. Whoa, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Wow, this that is, is awesome. Huge. Yeah, yeah so. I thought that was I, I didn't think that was ever going to happen. I have some customers who are actually using commercial tenants for Yammer for their communities of interest and such. So I'm, that's yeah. super exciting. Wow. Yeah. Exciting. You floored me. You floored me. I'm, <laughs> I got to get excited. I've, I've ignored everything about Yammer for so many years. Right. <laughs> actually, uh, one of the first questions we got uh, when Ign like Ignite was starting to happen was people were posting, uh, you know, when is Viva for Gov coming? I remember somebody like messaged me on Twitter and it was like five seconds after it was announced. And I was like, right. give me a minute to answer. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, I wish I don't have the answer yet in terms of, of, of timeline, but but they do have plans for it, which is really exciting. So that's really cool. That is that is awesome. I know from my perspective, this Ignite felt different than what we've seen in the past. Um, th this Ignite really felt like a, uh, a, a reset coming, you know, hopefully coming out of the pandemic uh, of what Microsoft was going to focus on for for the foreseeable future, and I, I I thought while the the mesh demos were not as technical as we're often used to, I really appreciated what they're setting as a tone for moving forward as to how people can expect to work. And I, I'm sure on the government side there was also some skepticism as to when and if that will come to us. But that really like. I was really excited about that from a usability perspective. It's the first time I ever saw something related to an AR, VR, MR headset and when I really want that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. Right? I'm I'm a VR for fitness enthusiast, so I have an Oculus headset that I've been using kind of to to help me get some cardio in during the pandemic. And that has been a lifesaver for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I do really see there's there's an interesting use case around VR, AR, MR really in the government space too. There's some DOD um, agencies that are actually using um, some HoloLens uh, applications for, you know, how they go about, you know, doing their mission focused work. Mm -hmm. And I think I think there's a play there in the future about how we meet together, how we accomplish work together, whether it's near or far. So 
I'm really excited personally to see how this evolves because I love VR and I'm just starting to get into that and I'm starting to see really the use cases of how it could expand. So that's yeah, awesome. the use case that really hit me what were the school settings. I was like, wow, right. You know, it's a totally different spin on being able to be remote and attend school. So I love that perspective. Yep. Hey Matt, you've been you've been quiet, letting us all all geek out a little bit. What what got you excited at Ignite this year? There's there's a couple of things actually <clears throat> that are actually happening behind the scenes that that had me really excited. I mean, so Ignite this year, I think to your point, Jay was was all about you know what are we landing, you know, where are we heading. One of those things that we actually talked about in my world, sort of the compliance world, is purview and the ability to extend sort of that MIP capability into non M365 environments. Uh, hugely significant capability. We're actually seeing the demand uptake there on both sides. My expectation on that was going to be customers that had been really focused in on MIP, wanting to move from the Office 365 environments into Azure and, and other environments with that. We're actually seeing it go both ways. I mean, people that are much further down the road on Azure in terms of structured workloads, that's actually driving a MIP discussion inside uh, the, the Office 365 world. You know, that said, this uh, Rima kind of laid some of this stuff out. Another big change that's not really, you know, visible is this commitment to make sure that we are engineering for government environments at the inception of our engineering process. I mean, so I'm I'm here to tell you as one who has been championing that on on the inside for a while to have very senior engineering leadership at Microsoft explicitly asking those questions. Yeah. during the design reviews for features about when are we going to land this in the government environments? Yep. Not wow. talk to me about that tomorrow or we'll figure it out later. <laughs> it's we're going to do that day one so that you won't see the delay and the lag that, that you have seen in the past. And we can talk a little bit about some of those things. I mean, around, yep. you know, do I really believe you, Matt? I mean, there's a couple <laughs> things that we've actually I mean, simultaneously shipped in, in, in my world. I mean, think feature sets that lit up in commercial, in GC, GCC, I, and DoD at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure people are fully getting that that we are absolutely you know, committed to, to doing that. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I believe in that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say uh, one of the early conversations I heard about this a few years back was the, 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 that conversation about why there's a delay and what mm. Microsoft is doing to ensure that these features are secure. So the fact that there is a delay makes sense from time to time, but but I do appreciate you know what you're saying. And, and Rima, I think recently you guys shipped, was it lists at the same time, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that was that was one of many. And so it, just like just like Matt so eloquently said, really, you know, myself and my teammates, especially in teams engineering, we've really advocated for Gov to say, how do we look at this at a different lens? How do we look at this in a different light? Um, and we've really gone all the way through our entire leadership <clears throat> chain. Um, and so they've they've kind of come on our, on our bandwagon and said, yeah, we're here with you. We want to make sure government has a first class experience. Mm -hmm. And so we really changed. We kind of changed how we develop and engineer features on its head. So now in the beginning, you know, all of the all of the clouds are looked at. It's not just commercial. So it's it includes education, includes all the gov clouds. And so features really don't move forward until there is some sort of plan for all those three gov clouds. And so it makes folks, I think, really think about, hey, what does this mean for our users? What's this user experience like? Um, it's also helped button up, I think, some of our communications around new features. Um, so thinking about Gov at the forefront has really, really changed, um, you know, how we've how we've shipped the, shipped those features. And I think I think there's more changes to come. Um, I'm not saying that we're perfect by any means yet, but I think I think we're we're improving. We've already improved quite a bit in the past two and a half years that I've been in team. So I'm excited for the future. Yeah, and That's even awesome. expanding on that for like Microsoft lists, I remember when we were first getting that announcement, I usually, well, I bug everybody asking them if things are in GCC, GCC high and DOD. Um, and when uh, the list PMM reached out to have something posted on um, her original community, uh, I had asked, oh yeah, is it, you know, when is it coming to GCC, GCC high and DOD? And she was just like, what do you mean? It's already there. And I'm like, oh, well, did you want to do a blog about it? And she's like, yeah. Uh, so... Uh, it, it was it was a huge change for me because I'm used to like, you know, kind of like what Rima was saying or, you know, to Matt's point too, like you're used to things coming later and it was yeah. 
all some shipped at the same time. Uh, and uh, shout out to Andrea Lum, awesome PMM for Microsoft lists. Um, I'll actually uh, give you her Twitter handle. I believe it's, yeah, just Andrea Lum5. Um, she's starting her Twitter not too long ago, so everybody go follow her. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was it was really refreshing to to have that all just sim shipped and just to be able to get out the messaging because I was instantly pinged with that as well. So it was really cool yeah. to uh, collab on that. I will say, Sarah, one thing I forgot to mention, and I think you and I always talk about this too, is that some of these features need to go through some accreditation as well. So I think mm -hmm. there's there's that piece. So yeah. we try to sim ship as much as possible, but then we have to wait based upon whether something has to get FedRAMP or DISA accredited. And right. so for the folks who don't know about FedRAMP or DISA, right? So FedRAMP is the U.S. government kind of owned authority that says, hey, we're going to credit you know, things for the government, you know, whatever technology it is, whatever vendor it is, you know, they have their own accreditation process. And so Microsoft has to submit our features to make sure that we follow those security guidelines. Um, and those those review processes happen twice a year. So sometimes you'll see a delay in features if it has to go through FedRAMP because we're beholden to FedRAMP and we have to wait for them to accredit. Same thing with DISA. DISA does, you know, the DOD clouds. Um, and so we have to wait until they approve, you know, sign off on paperwork for certain features before we can actually have it show up in that specific cloud. So unfortunately, I, you know, I did not to like make the conversation, you know, a downer. But like, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I get it. Because a lot of people don't, you know, they don't know like what hoops you have to jump through even right. you know explaining it to other yeah. members of my team that don't live in this world they you know they don't realize some of those obstacles that are not necessarily obstacles but you know hoops you have to jump through to to get it out there I, 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 for the users right like them <laughs> searching online and seeing these new features and just understanding like why they don't they don't have it available yet and i try to explain it not in the level of detail rima just provided which was awesome <laughs> but it's just helpful for people to understand the process yeah yeah i think the roadmap's done a much better job the teams have been doing a great job adding gcc gcc high into the identifiers in the roadmap um it would be interesting uh, if they're looking for room for improvement i'm sure somebody always is if we could identify um, features that are going to require that fed ramp or DISA clearance because it's an infrastructure change of some sort and so it's got to get accredited uh, versus yeah. ones that aren't going to be potentially held up in that process i uh you know maybe in the future maybe in a future episode we'll talk to what types of changes require what types of certifications etc as a software vendor going through fed ramp now it has been interesting to learn you know when we want to add a new feature to our tool set, which ones can be added without much hassle and which ones require our sponsoring organization to recertify everything that we're doing? So that's a good future topic that we'll, uh, I'll try to remember to put in a parking lot for a future. Note episode. to self. Yeah, note to yeah. self. <laughs> now, Jeremy, when we were going through Ignite, you know, admittedly, the government track was minimal, <laughs> but you pointed out there were a couple of things that were kind of tangential. Uh, to what to what's going on, right? Yeah, I think it's. I mean, as a government person, I'm always looking for the big announcements. Sure, I want to see the new things that are coming and and realize some of them are are not going to be here for a while. But there are a lot of things that are announced that government can take advantage of uh, right away, um, even if it's not announced as a government thing. So, for example, they announced um, the .NET Updater, a, a really interesting tool that'll help you update your code from you know your legacy .NET code into .NET five or .NET core. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're your development team is looking to, you know, re-engineer some things to keep it up on the latest versions, then this tool is there to help do that. That's something that's in preview, but it's available and it would be available for government people to use since it's a, a desktop tool, doesn't require any kind of like uh, infrastructure. Same thing goes for um, Power Automate Desktop. I'm extremely excited about Power Automate Desktop. And now that the licensing, like at least for the basic version of it, is included in Windows 10. Mm -hmm. And so there's not going to be any kind of purchase we need to do to go out there and take advantage of some of those very lightweight RPA um, capabilities. And so that's another tool that I'm looking forward to, to installing and, and checking out and seeing what it can do. Cool. Very cool. Now, uh, there were two specific government sessions, uh, modernizing security for government data centers and reimagining governance services with digital identity. Who wants to take what? Well, everybody thinks. I'll talk to the second one a little bit. I mean, okay. as, as a government person, right, there, there are government agencies that are have to interact with the public because they provide services. And so I think it's an interesting um, topic that 
government uh, people should go check check out that I mean that session. It's on my ignite. Uh, all the sessions were recorded, so they're available for people to watch again. But that one specifically was targeting how to do digital services when you no longer have an office front for people to drop into. And so it's it's kind of a uni unique take. You know, we've we've talked a lot over COVID about how we've worked together inside the agencies to better collaborate re doing remote work. Um, and that session took a unique take of, well, what about our customer? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would really recommend checking that out, especially if you work for an agency that has that, you know, public interface. Awesome. I think one of the things from this session I remember was um, it seemed like they were streamlining the authorization and authentication process for mm -hmm. vetting um, people that are submitting information to the agencies, which I thought could be helpful for agencies, you know, adapting into those methodologies. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I will have to go back and watch that one. That was one that I was not able to get to. Uh, what about modernizing security for government data centers? Who Who's up? Uh, Sarah, you're muted if you're if you're talking oh. to us. Oh, of no. course, okay, we had to have at least go. one one of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's because the, I'm by like the stupid air vent and uh, it keeps like kicking on, so I don't want to talk and it just goes. Um, anyways, <laughs> same experience. <laughs> <sighs> anyways, but uh, yeah, um, that session was with uh, Dennis Guzzi. I'm hoping hoping I'm pronouncing their names correctly, and Dean Lacovelli. Um, him I actually have talked to, and I think his last name is very fancy. Um, and <laughs> what? It's like this really like fancy Italian name. Don't kill me, Dean, if you listen to this. I mean, as Jay Leesk, I can, I can understand <laughs> seeing interest in that. Um, it's actually a really cool presentation that they put together, and it's about uh, how uh, you can use the Microsoft security solutions to fill in a lot of the, the gaps, um, especially with all of the attacks that are happening right now. Um, <laughs> he also has some really interesting phrasing that he uses throughout his slides. So um, there was one slide that it's like, it says something across the top, like, it's getting heckin' frantic out there. And I'm like, okay, thanks for the time. <laughs> All right. Uh, and talks about the different ways that you can consolidate, integrate, automate. Um, that was one of the other phrases I had taken notes on it. Automate the boring and automate the essential, which I thought was an interesting take. Oh, and yeah. there's the vent again. Um, it, and, and it does have a, a really interesting overview on how the Microsoft security products can be used to uh, to help in all of these instances. I'm not going to like, I'm not going to give give away the, I almost said spoilers, it's not a movie. I guess it is. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> what if he's sure to go watch this? <laughs> what? Like, what if there's a sequel? I don't want to know the ending. <laughs> in this we don't know oh. <laughs> oh boy so two sessions specifically government focused but as jeremy pointed out uh there's there's some other things that are tangential to the government space not government focused but still valuable to you and i mean as that earlier conversation was we're seeing things come out much more rapidly so whereas in past years you know, if it wasn't government focused, it wasn't of interest. I, I think we are getting closer and closer to a point where you need to pay attention to the announcements, mm -hmm. whether it's coming to our tenant today or not, because it's going to be valuable to you in the near future. Um, speaking of announcements, February was crazy from the, um, the number of feature announcements that came out. Um, I've got, I, I think I've got eight or 10 here just from top of mind trying to remember everything. Uh, but let's go through, uh, Matt, I think you wanted to talk first about the uh, understanding compliance article that Richard Wakeman put out. Yeah, this is an update to, to, I think, probably one of the most popular blog entries in like the history of the, the PubSec community there that, that lays out all of the differences between the, diff the, the environments that we've got. Um, and it branches into a lot of the things that we're talking about. I mean, th this is really the what actually has happened because of the engineering changes that we've made. I mean, so big change with that is now actually operating the commercial environment against FedRAMP High as well. So we've unified the, the back end essentially on, on where and how are we actually managing against compliance against all the environments. Yeah, you know, there, there are a bunch of announcements around all of the different Azure capabilities that are coming out at the FedRAMP High level as well. So I really, I would, would commend that blog to everybody because it helps you to understand exactly what's happening. Yep. And we're starting to see the result of that. 
I mean, as the back ends on this, the difference between Azure Commercial and Azure Government and M365 Commercial into GCC, GCC High and DoD start to, to become level set, it allows us to do these things like the simultaneous shipping uh, that we talked about before for the, the features that we've got. So it's really, it is well worth the time mm-hmm. to, to really read that and unpack that. I use it all the time. Even yeah. with government customers with like, don't talk to me about this. I totally get it. I understand it. Like, really? Do you? <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a lot of people that really don't. And, and yeah. the nuance that's there is really, really important. Um, and, and and that's where sometimes people get frustrated with, well, why doesn't this work? Well, because it was yeah. architected to work differently. And now you can understand what it is. So, again, fantastic update. Lots of positive you know, changes with that. And, and we really commend it to everybody. Mm-hmm. Similarly to making sure people understand, you know, the 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 many nuances of it, I've actually sent out as required reading to my entire public sector team, all of the sales and technical folk, um, the history of M365 Government Cloud. Uh, also, uh, Richard's been very busy over the last month, I can tell. But yes, he has. <laughs> What I really liked about this article is not only did it step by step talk about when things were released, which, by the way, I didn't realize that the DOD features came before the GCC high features, <laughs> um, but it, it really it it helped you understand why are there some naming confusions in the government space? Like, what does GCC mean and why are we using it? Uh, so I, I'm not going to go into it in detail, but if you support the government cloud at all, Absolutely required reading as far as I'm concerned. Otherwise, you really can't speak clearly to what it's called, why it's called that, how it works, and and how everything's interconnected. Mm. I thought it was an interesting announcement. I'm going to just jump in there, Jay. Yeah. Uh, that the uh, there's now US Gov availability zones in Virginia. So I know Virginia has been you know, an East Coast data center location for a lot of data centers. But availability zones are really, really important in terms of fallback amongst the data centers. So um, as a Govy, you know, we pay attention to those announcements and that helps us, you know, plan where we want to, you know, locate um, things within Azure. So we have that kind of failover, you know, um, data center capability. So that was a big announcement I thought uh, was worth mentioning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then there, there were a couple of other really interesting security announcements. Uh, Rima, Jeremy, I think you both have one on your radar that you wanted to talk about briefly. Yeah, Jeremy, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, I got to remember what it was. <laughs> Thank you for prompting, uh, for, for prompting me, Jay. Wow. Um, so for Teams, uh, we just found this out uh, that Teams is now JITIC. Mm. certified. So what does that mean? So for DOD, every sort of telecommunications platform needs to be JITIC certified. JITIC stands for Joint Interoperability Testing Command. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a command in the Army that actually does this accreditation. Um, And so they have accredited teams as as JITIC approved, which is exciting. Um, It only it took about I think it was like two and a half years, essentially for it to, to happen, which is Exciting. I mean, it takes a while to test these products, so that's really, really cool. So um, we're really excited about that announcement. So, all right. And I say so. So, so I was a bit confused because I don't really consider it security, even though it is security. But it was. Uh, I think there's an announcement related to DFARS. And for those of you in DoD, you know DFARS is. But for those who aren't, you know, in the in the government civilian side, we have the FAR, which is our big federal acquisitions regulation. And Department of Defense has DFARS, their version, the Department of the Defense version. And so there was a big announcement around um, extended support in terms of compliance and how. Microsoft 365 for government lines up with all of the requirements that the that the regulation produces for DOD. And so that's something to check out if you're in the DOD space. Um, it just further helps you when you're working with your contracting office. I work with many uh, people in my contracting office when I want to procure services. And uh, it also helps us to make sure we put the right requirements out there and knowing that there are services that can meet our requirement. Yeah, sorry, I prompted you poorly on that one. <laughs> that's all good. We'll, we'll get this by next time, I promise, or maybe the third time. Um, there was also, uh, there's a couple, there's one thing on certifications and another thing on apps and teams. Uh, Jeremy, do you have both of those or I don't remember who's talking? I think I, I, think I mentioned to everybody, I, I noticed that there was an announcement at, uh, at Ignite that um, said they added four new security compliance and identity certifications. And so for those of us, you know, in the IT fields, we know that those certifications can help us 
uh, not only gain the knowledge we need, but also help us, you know, for resumes and, and uh, future opportunities. Uh, keep you know, they, they do, of course, make sure our skills are up to date. So just at call out there that Microsoft's continuing to produce really, you know, a, a vibrant range of certifications. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's unbelievable. Every time I go the, to the certification site, there's there's more and more opportunities, and they're getting even narrower. Uh, instead of these really large, broad um, tests, now you can focus in on areas. So I think that's helpful. Um, and then as, in terms of the apps uh, for Teams, since uh, I know I know Rima's here, so she'd be able to speak probably even more intelligently, but I was really excited that um, for Teams meetings now, you can add in apps in the meeting itself. So you have that, you know, we, we really at my agency, as we rolled out and did adoption for Teams, we really emphasized the pre-meeting experience and how you could post, uh, you know, agendas and even chat about the meeting before the meeting even happened. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the interaction during the meeting and then post meeting, well, these apps actually add even more flavor to those experiences in terms of being able to, you know, put a polling app or something in place that will kind of uh, help drive the conversation around the team and around the meeting itself and help further ensure that as you come out of the meeting and you and you go into, you know, action items or whatever, that uh, everybody's uh, understanding what, what took place and what needs to go forward from that point on. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I mean, Teams is, you know, huge for everybody, not just government. Uh, but uh, we're always happy when there's um, features that we can take advantage of. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely the um, in map in meeting app experience as well from a um, just an engagement perspective and making sure that especially if you had to have a long meeting and you wanted to collect data in that meeting um, or if it's a training session. Um, and you want to make sure that people are actually really understanding the concepts of what is SharePoint, right? And how to use it. Um, and and after the meeting is over, just having that consolidated data, like the results right there, I think is helpful um, just to kind of reflect on it. Um, and then I don't know if this is in GCC or not, but I did see that there was an announcement about um, how you can close the chat function after mm -hmm. the meeting ends. Um, cause sometimes there are chats kind of still happening and it's my, it might be like weeks on end afterwards and you're like, yes. wait, what's this about? <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. From a usability perspective, trying to get people to stick to communicating here or there. And all of a sudden you have four chats where you don't know which chat to look in for that piece of information. I, I, I understand what you're saying there. So, uh, absolutely. That, and for those of you who are curious, I know Rima, you've pointed this to me a number of times. Uh, every month there's a article in the tech community about um, the latest news for Teams. And in the bottom of that, there's a whole section dedicated to what's new for the public sector uh, tenants. So very yeah. exciting. Go make sure you're looking on a monthly basis at this article. And if you don't wanna read every bit and piece because you don't quite trust us yet that they're coming, uh, which I, I respect, then just go down to the bottom and look at the announcements for what's coming to the public sector side of things, because uh, it's a focused set of content, just like this wonderful podcast for you. Yeah, can um, I just add, by the way, please. like that bottom section is actually what's just been released. So it's what's in Gov. So it's not even like what's coming. It's like what's just been actually like put into those Gov clouds, which is really nice. So you know for sure that they're there. Yep. Um, and even for some of them, like, for example, you know, like together mode or, um, you know, even for pop out meetings, for example, like that released in GCC high to be able to pop out your meeting. Um, mm -hmm. It gives you like a link to say, hey, here's how you tell your users how to opt into <laughs> that experience, which is really nice. So um, it's it's in the team's tech community blog um, and just look at that bottom, like Jay said. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we no, can and even thank start like posting snippets in the PubSec blog, too, if we want to direct people over to it. So, um, yes. Great idea. Yeah. Yes, you can. It can happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So did it, did I miss any news? Is there any other news or ignite conversations that we want to have before we jump into the community Q and A section? Well, All right. Things that, gonna... um, one of the features that I thought about, especially with um, because of Jeremy, was the uh, together mode scene, <laughs> and I just kind of thought because Jeremy has had like pictures like images of the office space and so i thought well wouldn't it be cool if you could have in your meeting the office space as the together mode scene that would be yes. awesome yes 
Yeah, yeah the, I, together mode is really, it's a long conversation about the value of together mode. I think it's kind of interesting, especially for that togetherness feeling. Now, I might not have every meeting in a together mode and maybe not all together modes make sense for me, but I do think there's it's an interesting way to kind of bring people together, much like this view is, so you can see all of our faces at the same time. Yeah, I think I, I think when they announced together mode, and uh, Rima, of course, is probably the bigger biggest, biggest expert we have available right now. But isn't there's brain science behind that in terms of how it really works with your head when you're in that mode? So it's an interesting feature, um, and it would be nice if we could customize that a little bit in GCC. I think there are, there are more options in commercial, or at least I've seen people do some interesting things in commercial. And if I could figure out how they did it, I'd, I'd do it in in, in my tenant. But uh, we'll see. I'll follow back up with you, Jeremy, on that one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So let's move into the community Q&A. We've got a half dozen or so questions. Um, as a reminder to our panelists, please feel free to be very interactive here. Um, we're going to start since we've got Matt here talking about com uh, security and compliance today, and that's really what the government focus was uh, with Ignite. Let's Let's start there. Um, how much longer will we have access to the classic AIP, Azure Information mm -hmm. Protection features uh, in the government tenants? Yeah, great question. Lot, lots of kind of energy around this, given the different deprecation schedules that are out there. So, I mean, I think as everybody knows, just to relevel said, we're shifting from AIP classic into the AIP unified labeling structure. So the deprecation in commercial is actually this month. The end of this month in commercial, AIP Classic, you know, will will be deprecated. There was a, a whole bit of energy, and probably where some of this question come from is is well, what's happening in government? Um, you know, so the government deprecation schedule remains unchanged. It is the end of September. I mean, so the the initiative there was a year of of kind of coverage once the unified labeling client and scanner were released. So that actually you know, rolled out for all of the, the PubSec and the government environments uh, you know, mid last year. So the end of September this year is when that actually will be deprecated from the government environment. So there was some confusion as to cross connecting that. And I think we created some of that confusion, full disclosure, and some of those blog entries have been actually updated um, you know, on, the, on the doc site because some of it cross connected kind of commercial and, and government. So it, it remains end of September. Um, all the uh, impacted tenants should have message center posts, you know, in with that information that that exists there. But just to confirm for everybody, that that great question, end of September. And uh, continuing down this po this this conversation path, so um, there's been a lot of conversation around unified labeling, whether it's sensitivity side or records and uh, management sure. side. Um, the question uh, is unified labeling and rec for records and sensitivity available in the DOD yet? Um, and how's that all looking? Yeah, so th this is a, again, another one that's important to kind of unpack a little bit. And this is where the government world and, and, and PubSec needs to, to now understand the changes that we enacted last year in commercial. So, you know, Jeremy, to your yep. point, like, I'm not going to pay attention to Yammer. Like, oh, they're doing this crazy <laughs> stuff with this, this commercial. It doesn't impact me. My world's not going to change. So that just to break it down at a super high level, um, the unified labeling, sensitivity labeling within the, the government environment has been live now for a while with the release of the unified labeling client and scanner. So for, for several months now, all government environments have been able to do both the manual and automatic classification, if you've got the right level of licensing on that, using the unified labeling client. That's that's the nuance here. The yeah. thing that's actually happening this month, and this is where some of these kind of questions come in, is behind that, all of the native capability, so using Office native without the need for the unified labeling client, and having the service actually execute on information. All of those capabilities have been live in commercial, and those are all actually, it's this month where all of those are kind of cascading into all of the different government environments. So once that completes, organizations have the ability, if all you're working with is actually Office file formats, you don't even need the unified labeling 
client to be installed, mm -hmm. you can actually use that. And in fact, the vision, just to set this for everybody, kind of the North Star, as all of these capabilities land inside the, the government environments, in the same way we're advising the, the commercial world, is to actually use the native capability to the maximum extent possible. You can set some switches and actually have the, the client still there for third-party file formats, but the thing that your end users will see while they're inside Office is actually the native built-in capability. So again, all of that is cascading in. So if you want to use sensitivity labels, absolutely can. You, you've been able to do that for a while using the unified labeling client. The new bit is, is that that kind of native built-in. And that's, again, all cascading in. That's in the it's on the M365 roadmap. You'll see that actually start to happen inside the tenants here uh, you know, very, very shortly. Yeah, we've got uh, a number of customers. Um, I've got a number of customers that are looking at uh, the unified labels, uh, both from a sensitivity perspective, trying to understand how can they use that to protect their data uh, mm -hmm. across the workspaces. So if they have a team that they know there's going to be a certain type of conversation in a certain level of sensitivity, how do we make sure that only the right people have access to it? But also from a records perspective, they're very curious about being able to handle their records management and, yep. and how can the unified labels fit into that process? Well, I mean, let's talk about that just for a second, just because you, you brought that up. I mean, there is a it, it is a natural discussion to, to connect those two things because you're using the term label. Right. Um, but in reality, you've got MIP, the Microsoft Information Protection side, sensitivity labels mm -hmm. sort of on one hand, and then you've got the records management, the retention labels, on the other hand, both both label terminology, but two separate you know systems and backends. And another really, you know, I'm really excited about the on the the MIG Microsoft Information Governance side, which is where those records management and those those retention labels live. We have just, I mean, I was last week just validated all of the UI has changed, all of the capability from the commercial side to include things like regulatory records mm -hmm. have now actually been rolled out across all of the government environments as well. You're not going to see it right away because you have to physically go enable that. I mean, enabling regulatory yeah. records is not something you want to do you know, willy-nilly. That, that, that has <laughs> got to be a very you know, deliberate decision, which is why we don't just kind of have that turned on. You've got to go take actions on it. But, but those things you will now see from commercial across all of the government environments, a parity in the UI and the, and the capabilities on the records management side. So you can have, at most, two labels on, on a piece of information from a Microsoft perspective. You can have a sensitivity label and a retention label. You uh, can't have two sensitivity labels or two retention labels. You know, it's, it's one of each. Um, but, but both of those are, are now at, you know, live. Um, and as we build that native capability in behind, you know, are, are going to be at parity. And again, the North Star for us is absolutely to have all of those capabilities at parity across all the environments. All right. All right. Some really good stuff coming out here. And, yeah. and Matt, thank you for digging into the difference between the retention and the sensitivity labels. It is a very popular topic that we have to have with our customers in, in helping them understand what's possible. So I really right. appreciate you digging into that. Um, and, and Sarah, I think we should get Matt to write an article about this <laughs> in, in the PubSec community. There we go. You think? That's, that's the new you job think? of this is uh. signing new content articles to the PubSec <laughs> No, I, I, I stalk these guys even, even on like, you know, like one of the last times like Rima put something out on LinkedIn, I think underneath it, I put a comment of like, bloggy blog time and then there were like 15 likes on yep. that. <laughs> so yes uh, that's yes, really that. good i mean since yeah, sensitivity yeah. labels are something i have i have not even looked at as a government person uh mm. with other capabilities there um but you know how do we apply to our actual content and then of course making sure our content is well marked and well articulated to begin with is it's a government challenge that I'm sure many government people are aware of. Uh, records, you know, records is always seems to get all the energy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I imagine it's probably a little different in a DOD environment because I know when I worked in DOD, since the sensitivity stuff was a much higher uh, issue to deal with. But um, interesting. Uh, uh, thank you, Matt. That was very informative. Yeah. And yeah, I'm definitely more to come from us on, on that. I mean, so to, Jeremy, to your point. I mean, things like capstone that, that yes. exist in terms of how you're actually doing records management, yep. controlled unclassified information, and you got the whole you know issues you mean, around oh, CUI that are out there. 
yeah. th these are are things that we think about a, a lot. I'm yeah. actually engaged, you know, both with sort of decision makers that are writing the requirements on the government side, as well as engineering at Microsoft, trying to make sure that we we bring some of those things together here and help organizations respond to that. So absolutely an organizing construct for us is CMNC with mm -hmm. all of the energy that's that's getting applied to, to that. Yep. Um, so we're, we're working hard to make sure that, that one, not only have the capability, but then two, kind of to, to Sarah and, and Rima's world and my world, making sure that we're explaining that effectively, you know, yeah. through the government lens. Great that I've got a capability, help, you know, explain to me how this fits into, I've got this requirement that I've got to go knock down. How, how am I going to address it with that? I really appreciate that because as a as a non DOD government civilian agency and one that's very very small on top of that, mm -hmm. CMMC is not on our radar because it's not a requirement. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's not to say that it doesn't have value. And as as the Microsoft offerings align with it, it's going to be in our best interest to understand that alignment. And again, I don't. I want to be really clear on that. I mean, CMMC is an organizing construct that that allows us to to put a lot of things into one bucket, and it spans, you know, certainly the entire defense industrial base sure. that works on this. But it also extends into, you know, labeling, marking, transmission requirements that that all agencies have from yep. mm -hmm. you know NARA requirements. I mean, if you're going to send something off to, to NARA, there there is a set you know, a bit of metadata that needs to go with it. There's a process and a format. How do I actually control this information through its life cycle? Really important, uh, you know, for us to, to, to do that. And again, the, the change that I am hoping that everybody will, you know, be seeing, we need to make this real for everyone, is that we understand that and that we're coming forward not only with the tech, but also with the guidance and the, the explanation of how all of this fits in, you know, to your world. Sure. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And, and in a future conversation, I'd love to talk more about the sensitivity types that go along with all of this conversation, too, because that there's a lot of native sensitivity types built in. And as I understand, that's been expanding, too. So that that's mm -hmm. another area where uh, we're seeing a lot of growth and, and uh, support from the Microsoft side. Mm -hmm. And then I remember in conversation at the beginning, we talked a little bit about Compliance Manager. Did anyone have a question about Compliance Manager that they captured or? Uh, yes. Um, so this was uh, from not only the public sector tech community, but also the Reddit community. Uh, and we were talking about it a couple of days ago, I think. But um, when the announcement came out about Compliance Manager being generally available, a lot of people were saying, well, I thought it already was there, um, <laughs> which <laughs> I gave them voices, okay? Uh, but it was only <laughs> it was only out in a in commercial. But I I know that uh, Matt had a great way of explaining this. So floor is yours, Matt. Yeah, yeah. there's a couple of things right. on Compliance Manager. <laughs> Again, it's I'm a big fan of of Compliance Manager and kind of what it does um, and, and and how it can actually help organizations. So to kind of unpack that that background. So Compliance Manager now generally available commercial GCC and GCC High. We're on the verge of of getting everything baked in for for DoD as well. I mean that's that that's about to happen. Um, the change that's happened here, it, while Compliance Manager was being developed and was a preview capability, it, organizations had two paths to kind of get into Compliance Manager type capability. There was one path that led through the Compliance Portal inside Office 365. If you're a Compliance Professional, so Compliance.Microsoft.com or compliance.microsoft.us, you know, if, if you're in the GCC high environment. That, that was one path. And the other path was actually out on the service trust portal itself, where you could actually get into templates and see things. So with the release of Compliance Manager as a generally available capability, all that's been unified and brought together inside the compliance portal inside Office 365. So that is your starting point. If you're a compliance professional, either in commercial or all the way through the government environments, that's where you will find the templates Mm -hmm. That's where you can customize those. That's where you will see the output of what the system is actually seeing and giving you credit for. So one of the great things about Compliance Manager in, in both commercial and GCC today, and, and again, we're very shortly inside the GCC high environment, is if the system can see you have taken an action, mm -hmm. it will automatically give you credit for that action against multiple different control frameworks. 
So if you've done something, instead of you manually having to go in and say, yes, I've done multi-factor authentication, if the platform can see you've done it, it'll, mm -hmm. it'll dynamically score that for you. So that's, that's a big deal. And, and it's a great capability for people that are either trying to assess Office 365 or demonstrate compliance built mm -hmm. on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final kind of thing that, that I'm you know, excited about the change that, that, that we've made. Everyone in, on the pub sec side and the, the government environments now actually have, um, a, as part of the advanced licensing, included the CMMC level one, two, three, four, five templates. Um, so in commercial, those are not part of that advanced licensing. You'll get the data protection baseline, uh, NIST uh, 853, ISO 27001, and the GDPR template. Uh, but in the the pub sec side of the house. And again, given this construct around CMMC and the, the uptake for that, we've included now the CMMC 12345 templates there. Um, and then my final final, because I'll, I'll give myself an alibi on this, uh, <laughs> the other, you know, into a preview capability. So the CM, the, there's the also the MCCA, the Microsoft Compliance Configuration Analyzer, yep. which is a set of PowerShell that, that if you can kind of download and run, that's now been updated to handle not only commercial GCC, uh, but also now GCC high and, and DOD as well. You, you, I mean, you check out the, the guidance on that. There's a couple switches you need to set to, to point it at the right Azure mm -hmm. Active Directory environment. So it's actually pulling the, the, the data that is appropriate. But another capability um, that, that I wanna make sure people are aware of, but we're really, really focused on trying to save everybody, you know, the work of actually understanding how we're operating the platform but then also allow you to build on top of that. I yeah. mean, the fact that you now can go get the system security plans. I mean, anybody wants to go read the you know, 800 pages worth of you know, great bedtime reading on you know, how we're, <laughs> we're landing this stuff. I, again, I, I commend it to you. It is, it is great. I've read it. It's, you know, yeah. I'm not sure many people have, but it, uh, it, it's really impressive. Like it really does at a very story. granular level. We, we unpack what we're doing and, and how we're doing it. And, and we want to be transparent with our customers on that regard. We don't want it to be, well, here's some third party assessor that gave me yeah. like, you know, a sticker that says I'm okay. Yeah. I mean, we really take it down to the granular level of even giving you the, the audit test plan. If you look at compliance manager and you explode that out, you will see that not only do we say this is the control, this is what it means, this is when and how we, how we tested it, but also the, the, the actual audit test plan. You know, what, what happened to make that auditor say, yes, this is, th this is acceptable? It's really deep information. Um, and it's an exemplar for, well, you have controls that you're responsible for also. So <clears throat> here's, a, here's a framework where you can actually um, actually use that to build on top of it. Interesting. Wow. So me getting excited about it, but yeah, there's no, another blog post on all of that too. So <laughs> it's good stuff. Ooh, all, all this heavy compliance stuff. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch Sorry, gears. Sorry, that's my bit. world. Yeah, it's my, yeah, uh, my yeah, lady. No, that's good. That's, uh, why we, that, and that's, that's why we invited you. Um, thank you so much. So uh, Amy, I want to ask a question because I know you do consulting for government agencies. I'm curious to know, because uh, government is slow, how, how how is government doing at adopting uh, something like Power Apps, right? Are, are they migrating their existing processes over? How, how does that, and, and how is that working in that space? Interesting. So um, depending on the agency, um, I will say some are moving faster than others, of course. Um, so I think that I am seeing a lot of good um, progress with really just embracing that whatever was happening with InfoPath solutions, um, Power Apps is a, an even better interface. Um, so I do see a lot of adoption there and also allowing, I would say, citizen developers um, in the agency to use um, more Power Automate as well. Um, and of course, uh, Jeremy, as we know, putting out that guidance <laughs> to help people yeah. along the way because people get really creative. They start clicking buttons. They start doing things. Um, so, of course, you know that um, getting ahead of um, just putting out best practices is um, key as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean I, I've been in government a long time and government doesn't like citizen developers. Um, 
so it's 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 interesting. Microsoft's force in our hand. <laughs> Chase left. Yeah, government. I mean, I mean, Microsoft's force in our hand to, to allow citizen development. Um, because once you once you create something, say in Power Apps, and you turn it on because it's an it, you know an agency required form for people to use, now you've turned Power Apps on for everybody, and it's kind of a crazy crazy uh, approach. So it's interesting to hear. Um, it's good to hear that government's going to adopt some concept around that. Or, I mean, or full, full disclosure, Amy and I actually work together, but <laughs> it, it, you know, it's still a struggle. I mean, Amy's an, an expert in this stuff, and and the government's not. The government hasn't got a clue. And I think that, and people might stumble on it too, like if they're in SharePoint, right, and they start clicking on buttons there and they see Power Automate. Um, I actually had a friend, she is at HUD, and she called me and she says, Amy, I need you to help me figure out this Power Apps. Um, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's look at it together, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's interesting, right? Because I think that the power is once you can kind of like wrap your mind around how it works, then I do like the fact that it takes the pressure off of IT having to do all the development. Um, but of course, there has to be a level of support to kind of hold their hand. And it could be self-service support here's videos for you to watch or it could be that you know um the help desk or the service that's actually you know troubleshoots and um gets people through a finished product yeah. it's all about your um it's all about your service model really training and yeah. support model uh, there's a note jay a future future possible topic is how agencies are taking on this power apps challenge I think that'd be a great conversation. Uh, it's and and it, for those of you who who are curious, you know, how can we move forward? I highly recommend. I, I go back to the story all the time. Uh, Summit Siani uh, from Heathrow Airport yeah. uh, is a prime example of what you can get and how you can improve your organization by enabling the citizen developer. Um, I, I won't go into it in detail, but I'll make sure we put something in the in the related blog article here that links over to his story. It's it's really mind blowing what happens when you empower your your staff, your your mission workers to actually accomplish their mission instead of dictating this is the only way you can do it. Um, and the solution is not just turn it off. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. I understand how in this space it's the desire, but it's not the solution. <laughs> right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Amy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so in the interest of time, I know the production team is hounding me that that we're ha having such great conversation mm -hmm. that we're momentarily going to run over. So real quick, before we do run out of time, uh, I want to make sure that we hit up the final piece of the agenda, which is our community events for March and April. Uh, so I, I know I've got a couple. <laughs> I know I've got a couple. Um, uh, the Nova 365 user group is the Northern Virginia, Azure, and Microsoft 365 user group that I run. Nova365.ms. Uh, we have a, a an event on the 11th and another one on the 25th. Uh, the 11th, we're talking about maturity model in Microsoft 365. And on the 25th, policy management in Teams. Uh, Jeremy, you run a user group focused on government. Do you want to talk about what you guys have coming up this month? Yeah, so uh, this month on March 15th, uh, from uh, 11 a.m. to about 1230-ish, we hang out, do a little bit of hangout. We're going to have somebody come uh, from uh, and talk about bots, uh, Teams apps and bots and GCC. They are a thing. And so uh, my good friend uh, Lisa Ruff and uh, her um Counterpart Joe Harris is going to join us at our meeting and just kind of have a casual conversation about what that means and, and how government can take advantage of it. Awesome. Lisa is great. They've got a really cool chat bot uh, application that they've pulled together and or bot framework that they've pulled together to really enable bot development. So I'm excited to see what she has to say. That actually leads me into uh, on the DOD side, there's an event coming up also on the 11th, the IL-5 launch for business applications. Uh, I saw that um, uh, Bobby Chang, who is a DC area um, uh, Microsoft employee, I forget his exact title now, uh, but he's speaking at it. So we'll put the link out to that. Uh, and then uh, Sarah, we've got the M365 meetup for Gov coming up this month. Yes. Uh, so on Tuesday, March 23rd, um, there's going to be uh, a power up uh, Microsoft 365 with the Power Platform. Um, that's a group mainly hosted by uh, Nick Nicholas Giard. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right. You are. Um, so <laughs> uh, 
I always try. Um, so that one is coming up. Uh, there is one also tomorrow as well um, that is coming up too. Uh, and those are posted in the meetup group as well as on uh, public sector. So cool. please check them out. We'll make sure to get links to as many of these meetup groups as possible. There's three other user groups in the area. Uh, there's SUG DC, the uh, SharePoint user group of DC, which has an event uh, also on the 11th. Boy, the 11th is a busy day for community wow. events. Wow. Um, they're doing Office 365 governance. And then there's two others that I didn't have events uh, or, or titles, but on the 18th, the Baltimore SharePoint user group has an event. And on the 31st, the DC Azure user group has an event. So there's, there's a ton mm -hmm. going on, much of it focused on public sector. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to everyone else in the group. It, did I miss anything? Did you have any parting words you wanted to say? There, Summit 7 on the 16th of March is doing a, uh, a webinar with uh, Matt Sozman, uh, one of our own. He's a senior security architect. Um, and it's going to be on CMMC compliance with Microsoft Intune. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I did not have that on my radar. All right. I know. Don't you have don't you have two uh, events coming up, uh, Rima, for government specifically for Teams? Yeah, actually, I have I have one on the March sixteenth, okay. where okay. we um, it's a webinar um, where we actually talk about apps in Gov and the art of the possible. Um, so it's very like it's Gov specific, and we talk about what you can and cannot do right now in GCC and GCC High, and then also okay. the future of DC. So it's it's a good it's a good one. We we hope to have more in the future, but um, this is the third one of our series, so I'm happy to send out a link to on that. Yeah, I highly yeah. recommend it. I attended the first uh, first one in your series. It was fantastic. Woohoo! Thanks, Sarah. I'm gonna I'm gonna at the risk of saying something I regret later. We should make a community calendar for all of these things and put it on the tech community. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually been asked, and uh, and we are gonna start that. Where uh, yeah, I've I've had a couple of people be like, "Can you just do like a blog of just like all these events coming?" Right. Um, yes. So well, we'll, yes, that for, is coming. For start, yeah. we can include all of these things in our blog post whenever that goes live. All right, cool. Yes. Uh, so uh, on, I'm gonna just real quick on behalf of myself and, and I wanna thank all five of you for joining me. Uh, Matt and Amy especially for joining us with very little warning and an incredibly <laughs> long outline agenda of what we wanted to talk about. Uh, your participation today has been fantastic and I look forward to talking with you both in the future. Uh, Sarah, me, Jeremy, Sarah, me, Sarah, Sarah me? Jeremy, Rima. <laughs> Have they shipped us? Jeez. <laughs> we are. So... I want to thank you guys Sarah for me. helping me pull this together. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jay. It was, it's been it's been fun. We can't look to uh, looking forward to next next month, and uh, hopefully we'll see if the format changes. <laughs> right. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.